Hi folks, today I wanna to talk to you about flash duration and high speed sync. Two important things if you're trying to freeze action with your flash or if you're trying to overpower the ambient in a shot. And it's increasingly important as we head into the world of global shutters thanks to Sony and their upcoming A9 Mark III. So today I've brought along eight different great location flash options, as well as the Hasselblad X2D, which will let me sync all the way up to one four thousandth of a second, thanks to its leaf shutter design. Model Felicia as well, and we're gonna see what the flash duration of these different flashes are, and hopefully break down these complex topics in a reasonably easy to understand way. Hey folks, just jumping here in edit, I wanted to explain how we're going to test these units. This video is going to end up being really heavy, so I'm actually just going to show you the results of the different flashes broken up throughout this video, but I'll discuss it all at the end. There's enough theory in this video that we don't need two different discussions going on simultaneously. The shots will be taken at f8 at 1 350th of a second as their starting point at base ISO and then we'll see how the flash power falls off as we increase our shutter speed. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is what is your flash duration? Simply put, flash duration is how long it takes your flash at its given settings to dump all of the power. So this is going to depend on the exact model of flash you're using and your power setting. So just making up these numbers, you might, for example, find that your flash at full power needs one four hundredth of a second to discharge all of that power. But if you drop down to a quarter power, that it's able to do it in, let's say, a thousandth of a second. Now, the reason for that is most flashes, when you reduce the power output, like going from full power to quarter power, they don't actually reduce the intensity of light, they just turn the light on for a shorter amount of time. Now, that can be a little bit weird to get your head around, so let's look at it using this continuous light as if it were a flash. So just imagine it's all slowed down. Instead of talking about hundreds or thousands of seconds, we're talking about full seconds. So let's say on this flash, full power, needs one second of light. So we hit it, it goes on, one second later it turns off, and in that time the amount of light is building up and building up and building up until it's fully discharged. And if we want to do a half power, then it's only turning on for half a second. So you get half as much light coming out, it's at the same intensity, it was just on for a shorter amount of time. Now it's not perfectly linear like that, that half power is twice as fast and a quarter power is twice as fast again. There's a curve to it and the curve also varies on each of your flashes. But in this way, you can think about your flash duration as essentially being a second shutter speed for the shot. So we all know that if you're not using a flash, you're just using ambient light, daylight or continuous lights, that you can speed up your shutter speed to then capture moving objects nice and sharp, right? And the faster the object's moving, the faster the shutter speed you want to get it nice and crisp. Well, just imagine you were shooting in a really dark room, almost completely dark, where you might need like a one minute long exposure to get anything to show up, and you're going to shoot someone firing a pistol, and you want to capture the bullet coming out. So you could put on some incredibly bright continuous lights in the room, and then use the fastest shutter speed on your camera, and you may be able to capture the bullet in moving. It probably wouldn't be pin sharp, but you'll be able to capture it, right? Well, you could also do it, instead of using the continuous light, by using a flash that has a really short flash duration that's able to dump the power really quickly, and if it does that in, let's make it up, at 10,000th of a second, then all the light freezes your subject in that one ten thousandth of a second. So whether you had a one second or a two second or a five second long exposure based on your camera's shutter speed, the flash duration is going to freeze the action for you anyway and it acts as a shutter speed. Are you with me so far? I know this is a lot to take in. We have a couple more topics to talk about. Let's jump back and look at a few more flashes and we'll come back to continue the lesson. Thank 
you to B&H Photo for sponsoring this complicated video. If you're in the market for a flash unit, check them out. If you purchase using their Payboo card, B&H's exclusive in-store payment card, you instantly get credited back the amount of sales tax on your order. For some of these pro photo units, that can work out to be thousands of dollars. Check out, the full details are in the description below. Okay, welcome back to the classroom. Now, let's talk about how manufacturers talk about flash duration and how you can find out what your flash's duration actually is. I have to say the way manufacturers talk about it is really not user-friendly at all. First of all, a lot of manufacturers just don't publish what their flash duration is. Higher end flashes tend to, but there's two main ways that they measure flash duration and neither of them actually measure the full flash duration. There's T5 and T1. So T5 is measuring how long does it take your flash to discharge 50% of what you have it set to. So if you have your flash set to full power, how long does it take for it to discharge half power? Or if you're set to a quarter power, how long does it take to discharge one eighth power? It's really not helpful at all. And that's the number that a lot of manufacturers share as their official flash duration is T5, so actually half. The other measurement, T1, is how long does it take to discharge 90% of the flash setting that you've set. So that's much more useful for us as photographers. We know that we're getting most of the juice in that period, but it's still not 100%. And the way that curve of distribution tapers off varies flash to flash. So you might find that last 10% takes ages or it takes a really short amount of time depending on your flash. So let's say your flash needs, it's quite slow. Let's say it needs one one hundredth of a second to discharge the full power and your cameras can sync up to one 250th of a second. So let's say you've set it to one 200th, so you're in the safe zone. Well, your flash actually needs one 100th and you're only giving it half of that amount of time. So you'll actually find that the flash lit areas without changing the flash power will get brighter as you slow down your shutter speed because it needs that amount of time as it's keeping the flash on, it needs that time to actually get all of the juice out. So keep this in mind as we test out more of the units that the way that that fall off occurs varies flash to flash. You'll find some taper off really quickly, others do it much more gradually. And keep in mind that flashes that have a really fast or short flash duration tend to be much more expensive. Brands that you know studio photographers are using that actually promote the fact that they have a short flash duration, you could be talking 10 times the price of an entry level model. And I'm actually running out of light to focus here, so let's turn on my modeling. Oh, I'm a god. <laughs> If you'd like to get more hands-on with this and a bit less theoretical, check out my courses over at learn.mattgranger.com and you can also see the different workshops that I have coming up at mattgranger.com forward slash workshops. Okay, so the last thing to talk about is how the different shutter types, like the traditional a global shutter or a leaf shutter, how they actually work and how high-speed sync works. So often when I talk about the advantages of a leaf shutter or more recently a global shutter, I see your comments on YouTube from some people saying just use high speed sync and then the whole level, you know, it's a level playing field then and you don't need any of those new technologies. Yes and no. High speed sync will let you get an exposure at a sync speed above your camera's maximum sync speed but you won't be getting anywhere near the am full amount of juice that your flash actually has to offer. And if you're trying to use flash to overpower the ambient, that's actually a really big issue. So let's talk about how the different sensors actually work and what is the maximum sync speed as quoted by a camera. 
So let's think of a traditional camera, like my old D700, it had a maximum sync speed of 1 250th of a second. Now the maximum sync speed is not just marketing jargon that they're trying to push you up to higher models, it's actually based on how the camera has physically been engineered. The maximum sync speed is the minimum amount of time that that camera is able to have the first exposure curtain open before it needs to close the second. So just taking a step back, how that kind of a camera gets an exposure. When you take the photo, it may just sound like thud, 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 one noise. It's actually multiple things going on. So you first have one curtain that opens to expose the sensor to light and start the exposure. Then, let's say you're doing a one second exposure, it stays open a second, then a second curtain travels down in the same direction, ending the exposure, then they both reset, ready for the next shot. So if you're doing that at one second, we have it open, a second, close. If you're doing it at uh, one two fiftieth of a second, and then reset. If you go past your maximum sync speed, the first curtain doesn't have time to fully open, before the second one is starting to close already. So that's why when you go past your maximum sync speed and you're using like off-camera flash, you see that black bar in the image, that is the second curtain starting to close and it's blocking the light physically from getting to that part of your sensor. So if you go up to like 1 500th of a second, your first curtain is only open, let's say halfway, and then the second one is already closing. When you get up to faster numbers, like a thousandth, you might find it's just opened a tiny bit. And when you get up to like an eight thousandth, it just opens a slit and they basically move together like the line on a photocopy machine, basically scanning a little line of light across the sensor to build up the image. That's how they do it. So it comes down to how fast basically those curtains are able to move is going to determine your maximum sync speed on a traditional camera. On a leaf shutter camera, like my Hasselblad X2D, the shutter is actually in the lens and it's kind of like an aperture. It opens and closes like this. So in that case, the sensor is just there waiting for light. It opens, gives it light, it closes it. Whether that was for a 60th of a second or a thousandth of a second or a four thousandth of a second, whatever light is in the scene, whether it's coming from the sun or a flashlight or a strobe, as long as whatever light is in the scene, it will capture it. So if your flash is able to discharge enough power in a 2,000th, a 4,000th of a second, it's able to capture all of it. And then that's taken to a whole different place with a global shutter. So we actually have to take another step back to explain exactly what a global shutter is. It doesn't need a mechanical shutter at all because the sensor has been designed completely differently. So if you think again about a traditional sensor, this one, the ones in your DSLRs, anything like that, imagine my rear screen is the sensor. It's writing the image or it's capturing the image line by line. So from one side to the other, one side to the other, like reading a book basically, top to bottom, side to side, side to side, side to side. Now it does that incredibly quickly. You know, it may feel instantaneous, but we're talking hundredths or thousandths of a second, but it is still writing in that way. Whereas a global shutter has been engineered that it's able to just pull the whole image boom, off in one instance. Every single pixel, top left, bottom right, they're all written at exactly the same time. So that's why, for example, it gets rid of rolling shutter. If you're filming video with a traditional sensor and there's lots of wobble, by the time it gets to the bottom of the frame, the frame has moved so your vertical lines can get all wobbly. That won't happen if it's capturing every frame instantly, you won't have any wobble. So that means it can theoretically sync at any shutter speed. So the Sony A9 is saying 1 80,000th of a second. That, I'm not diminishing that, that is incredible. But there's two things you have to keep in mind. The first is, which flash is able to discharge in 1 80,000th of a second? Who's gonna get their T5 or T1 number done in 1 80,000th of a second? I can tell you, literally, absolutely nothing. There is no flash in the world for consumers that can do that. The best of the best of the best, the gold standard Pro Photo Pro 11, it's like a 20 odd thousand dollar US kit. It can, and it's specified to be able to discharge in 1 80,000th of a second, but the amount of power you're getting in that duration is 1 1,000th 
of what the unit is capable of. If you want to get an eighth of what it's capable of, you need to drop all the way down to one eight thousandth of a second. Still crazy fast, but it's still an eighth power. If you want to get, say, half power, you're back down to one fifteen hundredth of a second. And at that point, there's no difference to using a leaf shutter, which is also able to get a shot at 2,000, 4,000 of a second. Taking a look at the Pro Photo page, there's actually a few extra catches. Yes, it can do 1 80,000th of a second. As I said, it's at 1 1,000th power. This is a 2,400 watt second unit. But that's actually the T5. So you're at really getting half of 1 1,000th of the power. And you'll note that's using freeze mode. Freeze mode has a much wider color temperature stability. So another trade-off. In normal mode, to get a full flash power, the T1 is 1 400th of a second, and that's getting you 90% of the flash's actual output. And that's the best on the market. For anything else, at 1 80,000th of a second, you're going to be getting next to nothing. The other thing you have to keep in mind with a global shutter is it's epic that you can sync at those shutter speeds, but the laws of exposure still apply. You still have to balance your shutter speed ISO and your aperture to get a proper exposure. So if you're shooting at an 80,000th on a day like today, even wide open on a prime lens, you're gonna be in the tens of thousands of ISO degrading your image. And then the amount of light that you can actually get from a normal flash is gonna be so minuscule, you'll probably see it, but you're gonna be at a crazy high ISO. Your ability to overpower the ambient is gone because you're at such a high ISO and because you're getting relatively a tiny amount of light out of your flash. Even out of that $20,000 one, you're getting one one thousandth power. So just keep that in mind that whether whatever camera you're using, the basics, the fundamentals of exposure apply in every instance. Now, if you're still awake, Give me a high five in the comments. I'm impressed at your staying power. The last thing we need to talk about then is how all of that relates to high speed sync. So thinking back to your traditional shutter where I was explaining basically the first curtain is opening as the second one's closing. So you get faster and faster and that slit of light is getting narrower and narrower. What high speed sync does is you can think of it in two ways. Either it's continually popping the flash, pop, 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 pop to match those lines as it goes down the sensor and paint it in real time to give you an even exposure where you don't get some lines brighter than the other. Or you could say it's popping so frequently it basically just turns the light on and holds it on. Now in either case, you're only getting a fraction of the flash's actual theoretical output. If you just think about that like it may pop 200 times when it's matching up all of those little lines, then you're only getting like a 100 or a 200th of power. So your ability to overpower the ambient by using you know, half power, full power on your flash close to your subject so they're bright, your camera settings darken down the background, you get that nice pop. You can't get that to nearly the same extent with high speed sync. Yes, you're able to darken it down more because you're using a faster shutter speed, but the juice you can get from your flash is so much more reduced. Whereas with a leaf shutter or a global shutter, whatever your flash's duration is, as long you can basically shoot up to that point. So if my camera can do 4,000th and the Sony can do an 80,000th, but my flash duration is say a 1 1,500th to get out a full power burst, then I can sync both of them at 1 1,500th. Whereas at 1 1,500th on high speed sync, I would be getting a small fraction of the flash's actual maximum output. I've lost my voice, you probably are asleep, so I hope you have a really good rest. We're gonna finish up shooting, and then if you wake up again, I'll see you in studio to talk through how the different flash units did. Well, I am so happy to see you. I'm impressed that anyone has made it this far in the video. I really took my time writing this one. I hope it all made sense for you, all of that theory, and I hope it's cleared some things up for you. Global Shutter is going to introduce a new era in many, many ways, but I think people need to understand these fundamentals to know that there's limitations. We're in the first generation, after all. Flashes, no doubt, the technology is going to evolve over time. Now, I wanted to run through and I'll show you the images and I'll show you the histogram because 
that's really what you want to see to be able to tell when the exposure is dropping off. Of course, as I increase my shutter speed, you're going to see the background areas get darker and darker, but if the flash power hasn't been cut off, as in we haven't yet hit its T1 time, for example, then you'll see that she stays pretty much the same. So let's go through these in order from brand smallest to largest. So the Godox V1, to get an exposure at those settings of base ISO F8 and 1 350th, I needed to be at full power. Going to 500th, you can see there's already a small drop there. Going to 750, there's a huge fall off. This next shot is the Godox AD200, and note we were using the round head, which I think is probably the stronger of the options. It was able to sync at one quarter plus 0.7 stops. That's kind of confusing, but you gotta keep in mind, you go down in thirds of stops on some brands and in others in tenths of a stop. So I go down to a half and it's still a bit too bright. I take it down another third of a stop and that means I'm at a quarter plus two thirds. It's kind of hard to get your head around. Anyway, going from 1 350th to 1 500th, a small drop to 750 and noticeable, but then, really a tiny drop going to 1 1,000th, 1 1,500th, and then at 1 2,000th, it really bottoms out altogether. Looking at our cute Pro Photos. Now, the Pro Photo A1 in the most common form factor, I was able to balance it at half plus 0.3 power, going up to 1 500th, 1 750th, 1 1,000th, all tiny drops in output. At 1500th, a little bit more, and at 2000, larger, but still, it seems to discharge really quickly. We didn't get a significant drop off in any of the settings there. The A2, however, I was actually up at full power, so using almost double the power settings compared to the A1, despite being a model higher in the range. And it was still a little bit dark, even at full power, and slowing the shutter speed down did brighten it up a little bit. So I think this guy actually has quite a long T5 and T1, and if you're trying to get the fastest possible, I don't know that it's the best option for you. Stepping up to the B10X, there we were at half power and a third, so actually the same power as we were using on the A1. At going up to 500th, a tiny drop, 750 more, uh, 1 1,000th tiny again, 1,500th small, and at 2,000th it just suddenly cut out there. So where, you know, it seems to have a different shape curve than some of the others. The Westcott FJ80 Mark II, it was at a quarter plus 0.5 stops, so well within its range. At all the way up to 1 1,500th of a second, there was very, very little fall off. And then more noticeable, but still relatively minor, going to 1 2,000th. I'm really impressed with this guy. Bang for buck, size, compact, great touch interface, and a really fast or short flash duration. That's a great option. The Going up to the FJ200, it doesn't have kind of the same style or finishing, I think, compared to the 80 or the 400, but a lot of juice. Here we were down at an eighth plus 0.5, and pretty much the same. We were getting great amount of power out of this all the way up to 1500th and a more noticeable, but still relative to some of the others, minor drop off at 2000. You know, some of the Pro Photo, for example, just disappeared at 2000. So pretty great result. Now the interesting one for me, the um, FJ400 was using the same settings, was actually a bit darker than the FJ200 in the same way that the, some of the pro photos, the higher models, didn't seem to actually discharge quite as much. Now I have to keep in mind, this wasn't done in a lab under controlled testing, which I could have done, but the point of this was to show overpowering ambient. And we were shooting from like three in the afternoon through to sunset, you saw me, turn the lights on with my mental powers. And I'm actually running out of light to focus here, so let's turn on my modeling. Oh! So that is also going to impact our overall exposure. Now I have to say, you do to an extent get what you pay for, but I would say that the Westcott FJ80 and FJ200 for location work would be 
my top picks. And you may have realized that often when I'm doing the gear review component of videos, it is to do with what I'm personally interested in. So having said all of that, thanks to our sponsor of this video, b &H Photo with their PayBoo card. Check it out below if you're buying any gear, small or large, why not save the sales tax, get it instantly credited back to you, it's a great deal. Do check out my different courses. They're not nearly as theoretical heavy as this and any theory that we talk through, I go through practically and show you the application which helps it gel in most people's minds. And I really hope that I'll see more of you on the road. I'll be heading back out doing tours and workshops through 2024 all around the world and it would be great to meet you guys face to face. Let me know any questions you have and I'll see you soon.